first one we were pointing out the number of rates. So you can always try some of the point out the actual it's coming out now. Okay. It's reporting now. So okay. I mean, we can always just use it. And we can Okay, let me welcome you to this other new inspiring talk from our seminar series in development studies. I'm very glad uh, to have you all of you, of you here and to host Professor Joan Martinez Alier on such a very such a fascinating, challenging topic. I'm also glad we managed to include this in this series because uh, I've personally observed a, a growing interest from our students on issues related to to, the, to environment, to political ecology, and to political and social mobili mobilization within this field. So much so that we now have also our own <coughs> master in environment politics and development in our department. So I'm very glad to offer you this talk and to see my older new students happy. Um, <coughs> Professor uh, Martina Salier will be enga will engage in a discussion of whether we can talk of a global movement for environmental justice. He is a leading authority in the field of ecological economics. He's been professor at the Department of Economics and Economic History at the University uh, of the Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona uh, since 1975. He is author of numerous publications and academic art articles in the fields of agrarian studies, ecological economics, and political ecology. Uh, he's been concerned with uh, particularly exploring the implications of ecological economics for developing economies. So this is of great interest to us. Is a founding member and a former president of the <clears throat> International Society for Ecological Economics and served as a member of the scientific committee at, at the European Environment Agency. He is also a director of the Environmental Justice Atlas. He will talk about this uh, in more detail. We are also glad to have here uh, Dr. Subir Sina from our Department of Development Studies. He is a senior lecturer uh, of, as, of firm, like trained as historian in political sciences, science, uh, who has written on Indian environmental history, social movements, and small scale fissures in Kerala and the Malayan forest populations, as well as on planning, civil society, Marxism, Marxism and post-colonial theory, and in particular on political subjectivity in relation to this possession. Uh, he has been a fellow at the Yale Institute of Agrarian Studies, a winner of the Bernstein Bias Prize for 2013, and also author of one of the 40 best papers in the Journal of Peasant Studies. He is currently working on a book on political ecology of the commons. We will have uh, around 40 minutes talk, uh, then uh, Subir will engage in a discussion of the, of, of the talk. You have around five minutes, Subir. Then we will open the floor uh, to questions and answers from the audience. Let me just remind you a few um, details. If you are tweeting, you can use SOAS Dev Studies and ESR, uh, ESRC as hashtags. There would be some pictures being taken and posted, posted on our uh, Facebook page. Uh, there is a sign up sheet that is being uh, circulated. So if you want to leave your contact for to be updated about not only this seminar series but also other activities uh, in our department, please leave your contact. And uh, for those who want to stay, there will be, as usual, a small reception in the subcommon room upstairs at the end of the talk. Thank you. Well, I hope, yeah, thank you very much. And I hope this is going to be put in some web page somewhere because uh, it's a bit long. So I won't have time in 40 minutes to go through all of it, the PowerPoint but you can look at it uh, afterwards. 
Also, you see there are several causes because it's true that this environmental justice uh, alters that we are doing cannot be the work of one person or two persons, it's a big group. And Lea Tempa has been very instrumental in getting this going after three years in a European project. So we are all based in, in Barcelona and I'll explain who it is. Thank you, yes. And well, this is a put a question mark. This is an article which is going to be published soon, I hope, without a question mark, because I think uh, there is indeed a movement for environmental justice in the world, and the question is how to show or to prove or to to make it plausible the idea that there is an environmental justice movement at world level. And I'm going to use like two pieces of evidence, and I would be very interested in your reaction to this, whether you are convinced by it. One would be the fact that there are so many ecological distribution conflicts in the world, and we are collecting many of them in these atlas. But of course, there are many more than we are collecting. There must be, I don't know, tens of thousands of envir social environmental conflicts in the world today, isn't it? At different scales. So I'm going to talk about these ALDAS. And what the ALDAS does is explain here. We classify the conflicts, we explain what they are, and then we can select some variables and do some, what we call uh, tentatively, statistical political ecology and we are also trying to show in future that the conflicts arise at least the extractive uh, resources uh, conflicts uh, arise because there is a change in the metabolism of society for instance in Argentina now there is mining copper mining for instance and there was no copper mining before so it's logical and it happens that there are new conflicts about copper mining, isn't it? This is what it means. And metabolism means the flows of energy and materials. This is what social metabolism means, or the metabolism of the economy, to study the flows of energy and materials, and then how the materials become waste and the energy becomes dissipated energy, isn't it? This is the metabolism of the economy. And a lot of these conflicts take place at the commodity frontiers. And if there are anthropologists here, must be some anthropologist. Is a word coming from Jason Moore and coming from world systems theory, commodity frontiers. So metabolism and commodity frontiers are the kind of words which are, I'm not going to talk very much about them, but they are in the background of our work. So we collect these conflicts because we think that there is a logic to the growth of the number of these conflicts and the spread of these conflicts around the world. I said already that we do or we try to do comparative political ecology with a statistical element in it. And we also use, of course, second hand social movement theory. And we try to answer questions as the following, which uh, I am not going to go through all of them, but for instance, whether the conservationist movement appears in our samples of conflicts very often in alliance or perhaps in, in contraposition to the environmentalists of the poor. For instance, defending mangroves, you can sometimes find poor people, poor women defending mangroves and also perhaps the IUCN, but quite often this does not happen. The IUCN has nothing to do with environmental justice in general. I am simplifying it too much, but I mean, this is what one would try to find proofs of this kind of statement. And if we go to the bottom of this page, or here perhaps, with the Chinese companies, one could do some network analysis of the companies involved in mining conflicts for interest around the world, and Billington, Butapea, Rio Tinto, and so on. But also, increasingly, we could show that more Chinese companies are appearing. Of course, everybody who does this type of mining knows this, but we can have some kind of evidence of this and how they behave. And the last two last ones, I put them in red because I think 
uh, we can ask and perhaps answer this question, how often are these um, extractive projects, meaning mining, but also biomass projects like oil palm, palm for instance, or seed farming or eucalyptus plantations, biomass conflicts, how often are they stopped? Or first, how often these projects become conflictive? And of those who are conflictive, which are conflictive, how often are they stopped? I will say something about this later on. And also we can have some statistics about how many, well, we don't know how many, but I mean some figures about the very frequent deaths of environmental defenders. So this is the kind of thing that we can do with the others, and other people are also doing with other inventories of environmental conflicts. In fact, the idea did not come from us, came from OCMAL in Latin America, which is called the Observatory of uh, mining conflicts in Latin America, from grain with these maps about land grabbing, from the WRM on conflicts about uh, tree plantations, and other groups around the world like Fio Cruz in Brazil, who already were doing maps, maps of conflicts. And of course, doing maps now is much easier than it used to be. So, and what I'm going to do also is to discuss not only the ALDAS, but also to discuss these grassroots concepts of environmental justice, not those coming from the academy, like ecological footprint, for instance, or ecologically unequal exchange, but a kind of grassroots conflicts, of which I give some examples here. Environmental racism or environmental justice itself come from the US environmental justice movement in the early 80s or popular epidemiology or sacrifice, all, all these here are examples and then later I will give a much longer or a bit longer list of terms which in the last uh, 30 years or 35 years have come to be used by different people in different places in the world, in different languages and they are born from this ecological distribution conflicts. They are not born in in the universities, although they are used by, by, by researchers, they have been born, for instance, climate justice, I think there is a kind of bottom-down climate justice discussion by several people, but also there is a kind of bottom-up, so to speak, climate justice discussion coming, for instance, from Delhi already in 1991, in the, with the distinction between luxury emissions and subsistence emissions by Anila Garval and Sunita Narain, isn't it, from an NGO in 1991. So we'll find many of these, I'll go to this later. And even a third point I would like to make, but there won't be much time, but I'll leave it here as a discussion, is about this possible alliance between this global environmental justice movement, which is, in my view, very large and growing, and the small um, degrowth or decroissants, I don't know whether this exists in the UK, but yes, prosperity without growth, to quote Tim Jackson, isn't it? The prosperity without growth movement in Europe or the US, the steady state economy, which is uh, Herman Daly's way of talking about it. Is there an alliance? Could there be an alliance? This, I think, is quite important in practice, whether north and south or north and, uh, and the entire planet can move into this kind of alliance. So I hope to have three or four minutes on this at the end. This I have already explained. So I'll put to start, I'll start with this. This is a, a photograph taken in, in 82, 1982, in Warren County, North Carolina, and these people coming from the civil rights movement in the US are lying on the road to prevent, and successfully in this case, but successfully sociologically and politically, to prevent these trucks coming in with PCB, with some kind of toxic residue, they thought, and they are demonstrating in this kind of uh, uh, civil rights uh, movement coming from, well, it came from Gandhi through Martin Luther King, 
and uh, and the question is that this was or is seen in retrospect as one of the first or perhaps the first moment in which the environmental justice movement in the US came into being. Of course, there have been other episodes for a very long time of other people complaining against toxic waste or against against uh, uh, extractive industries like the Navajos against uh, uranium mining in New Mexico. But there is in the US an environmental justice movement and this is the starting moment for it. And, but more or less at the same time in the, or a bit later, in the mid 90s, when his books like Patrick McCulley writing this book against dams around the globe, and then being then instrumental in this international rivers network, and he still is. And Ricardo Carreri, who died recently, and Larry Loman, who is very much alive, they published Pulp in the South with a subtitle, which I don't remember, but the book is about all the complaints or many complaints around the world against eucalyptus or melina or acacia plantations with the slogan tree plantations are not forests which is still put forward by this movement of course it's not a movement it's many movements and sometimes they get together and they invent slogans like that one also have noticed that more or less also in the 90s leonardo boff who was a liberation theologist i quote him because well, because I read him at the time, I think we were writing a bit secondhand actually, but he's become more well known now because the Pope, in fact, the Pope doesn't quote him by name because he's too controversial, I understand, in the church, because he was expelled, isn't it? Brazilians here would know the story. But the Pope in the encyclical, Laudato Si, he quotes both without quoting him, so if he were a an academic paper or, or a thesis, people would say the Pope is not very careful with his words, but apparently, well, I mean, you know, the Holy Ghost also takes part in all this, and I'm not going to criticize the Pope. It's a very interesting encyclical. And he says several times, uh, cry of the earth, cry of the poor, straight from Leonardo Boff, who of course got this from the movements in Brazil and Latin America in general, as the Pope himself. The Pope, in I think I mentioned this later, he has two paragraphs in the encyclical on the ecological debt, paragraphs 51 and 52, again copying, taking notes somebody took for him of many discussions in Latin America, without quoting the authors either, who would be from Chile or from Argentina or from Ecuador. So there are these connections between the environmental justice movement in the US and all these world movements of the 80s, like Chico Mendes, or the 90s, like Ken Saraweeva, another Ogoni people in the Niger Delta. All these are part of the global environmental justice movement, in my view. <clears throat> and this is a picture of the ALDA some months ago. Now we have more cases. We have we're increasing about 40 or 50 every month. And we have some articles published, and this is one that you can see because this is very easy to get in open access. You can, anybody in the world can read. And we have a second article coming up, and so we'll have many more articles. And other people are going also to use the others for their own work, probably. So what we do is to get this commodity approach. I sometimes joke that this is a vulgar materialist approach. So in which we take the commodities and we classify. So these points here, the colors refer to one of these 10 categories and only 10 categories, not to have overlap or to have classificatory doubts, isn't it? Each conflict goes into one of these 10 categories to start with. And then of course we can have a conflict on on biomass, which simultaneously is a conflict on on agrotoxics, or on bioprospection, or fisheries. So I'm explaining this not because it's the best way of doing these things, but after a lot of thinking about it, and already about three years ago, we decided to have this classification. And for instance, we discovered later that, or I discovered, I realized that there was something called ilmenite, which is a raw material for titanium, isn't it? 
and you take sand from the Madagascar, Madagascar for instance, from other places. And, and so this goes into mineral ores and building materials structure, and among these, in the commodity called tit titanium, isn't it? So everybody, every conflict is classified in a way that we know where we are. And then we can, for instance, say, do indigenous people take part in titanium conflicts more than in other, I don't know what would be the interest of this, but we can, or are titanium conflicts more easily, or titanium projects more easily stopped than bauxite projects, for instance? Well, I don't think it's a very interesting uh, question, and even statistically doesn't make much sense. But one could do this kind of, of analysis because we have everything nicely classified. And we drew a lot on activist knowledge, as explained before. So we did not invent the idea of making an adverse or a map of environmental conflicts. But these other maps are smaller. So we are the, we have the largest one so far. And we are thinking of reaching perhaps 2,500 conflicts in which we no need more from China than we have now, for instance, because there are many conflicts in China, but we don't have the context to get them, and from Indonesia and other places, so that we have more or less something that people, we can ask people, do you think some important one, relevant one, is missing, and then we'll put it on. So that's the way. It's more like an incomplete inventory, more than a than uh, a representative sample, perhaps, of a, of a population that nobody knows what the population is. How many conflicts are there in the world about resource extraction or pollution? Isn't it? It's an impossible question to answer, I think. So, I'll go to some... <clears throat> so, we can say which type of conflicts, according to mining or, or this I can explain. Also, regarding waste, isn't it? And, and inside waste, uh, carbon dioxide, excessive amounts of carbon dioxide. So there are conflicts in the world about red or the clean development mechanism, but also about ship breaking yards in Bangladesh or in India, or waste, domestic waste in many cities in the world. But extraction, transport, and waste, this is what the conflicts are about. Either extraction or transport or waste. And many of them happen, are, are terrestrial conflicts, some are in water, isn't it? Water, in general waters or in the sea. And some could be also geoengineering conflicts in the future, for instance, putting sulfate particles in, in the atmosphere to stop solar radiation. This would provoke, it is already provoking, other types of conflicts. <coughs> We can also do studies of the companies involved and network analysis. And we can also do some more statistics like this, which is not very interesting, what I put here, but here is more interesting. Who are the social actors complaining? So this is something coming from uh, social movement, from Taro and from Tilly and so on. We ask in the database form, which are the actors uh, taking part in the conflict. The companies on the one side, government actors, but also the social, civil society actors. So we could here have a figure with about, this was in April last, this year, in April, when we had 1,300 conflicts in the database. And well, it's nothing as happens usually, it's nothing very surprising. The local environmental justice organization appear in many of them, and then in decreasing number. One thing that one could comment upon would be indigenous groups, which uh, I think they appear, of course, they, for instance, when we check, fortunately, in Europe, they don't appear very often. So it means that the database forms are well done, because, I mean, for instance, I am Catalan, but I am not technically indigenous, isn't it? And you all are indigenous of somewhere, or most of you would be. Perhaps you are indigenous of two or three places simultaneously, but uh, I mean, people who can appeal to Convention 169 of ILO or Adivasis in India. So if you say, 
they are, appear in these conflicts much more often than they appear in the population in Latin America and other places. Women is a strange category because, of course, women appear in all conflicts in some way. And we, what we try to do here is whether women leaders of these conflicts are in the database forms. And as you see here, we hit about 215. And so this would be good for somebody writing a doctoral thesis or a master thesis on women leaders in Brazil, for instance, or in Latin America in this kind of environmental conflicts. A lot of the work would already be done in the database forms. And then you can, of course, do it better or even complain against some mistakes in the forms and so on. So this is what religious groups are most interested. For instance, we get Pastoral da Terra in Brazil appearing very often, and we get some Buddhist groups in Southeast Asia appearing in the database forms. And these are forms of mobilization where the people complain, write petitions. This is very much what social historians have been doing for a long time, isn't it? The Cahier de Doléances before the French Revolution, without computers, historians have managed to explain all this. So it's not that doing statistics helps, uh, proves anything that we didn't know, perhaps. But so we have all this, but also this we could classify in a different way. Those which are uh, strong kind of, of actions like street marches or even taking up arms, we say here, or sabotage or occupation of buildings, and those which are very mild, and then try to explain or to correlate whether when people behave more... Is there anybody from Colombia here? Nobody from Colombia. I was explaining this in Colombia a few weeks ago, and for the Latin Americans, said, I was trying to find the word to explain acting in a strong way. And said, say, they son muy berracos, they said. Muy berracos means they are strong will people doing things, illegal things. So one could try to correlate this kind of more strong kind of actions with success in environmental justice or the other way around. Or perhaps we cannot find any correlations or even if we find it, perhaps we don't know what they mean or how to explain it. But anyway, this has not been done before. Nobody has had uh, and such a large number of cases and try to see what the forms of mobilization for environmental justice are. But you don't need 1,000 cases. You, you can find more or less the same thing with less cases. So I have here some examples. One example I would like to mention would be the last point here. There is a very nice recent article by Mariana Walter and Lady Urquidi in Geoforum just published one month or two months ago, in which they discovered, so to speak, that in Latin America there is a, from Mezquel and from Tambo Grande in Peru and then Argentina, has spread a kind of new institution of the local consultation, not with indigenous people and the Convention 169, but outside it. And sometimes with the effect of stopping the project, sometimes not, but it's something new that has arisen just without anybody organizing it, or perhaps through knowledge, through video uh, films that have circulated. So this is something that somebody called Melé in France, or other people call uh, the productivity of the conflicts. You have these conflicts and then suddenly, or, sudden, or slowly, some new institutions appear, or some new practices appear. And this is something I think also interesting for a study, for a thesis, to look at the, at the consequences of the conflicts, not just for the conflict itself, whether the project is stopped or not, whether people get killed or not, and so on, but whether from this conflict all the kind of, of practices or ideas or slogans arise. And this is a very uh, clear case that has happened in Latin America after Tambo Grande in Peru and Esquel in Argentina, that people know about it. And in many places, there is this trend to have public consultations, which the governments don't like at all. And they say the Constitution does not provide for this. But they have some political effects. You can read this article in Geo Forum. They have done this with only three or four countries. So it's not that they, they have uh, thousands of cases. On the outcomes, 
one could have all sorts of moderate outcomes like this, strengthening of participation or compensation, but one could also have outcomes which are different, for instance, refusal of compensation sometimes, or negative outcomes, we call this, negative, like displacement or criminalization of activists or repression, corruption or tar these are things that appear in the database form, so we can codify this and then we can have these numbers. And one number that I think fits quite well with the statistics published by an NGO called Global Witness, which I think is in London, and Global Witness, they have published the names even of about 500, 600 people killed as environmentalists, but not, of course, from from the IUCN, perhaps there are a few, or from the WWF. These are the environmentalists, the environmental defenders from the global environmental justice movement. They have no, they are not going to the World Conservation Congress, well, especially if they are killed already, but I mean, they, they, they is not these sort of people, isn't it? They are not IUCN, W, Nature Conservancy, which they do other things. These people are sort of being killed because they are on the front line of these fights like about extractive resources or against local pollution. And in about 12% of the cases, deaths appear. In some cases, one death, in some cases, two or three or four. And we are now sorry that we did not collect the names at the beginning. And now we are trying to put more names about it. Because if not, who is doing this? Nobody's doing this. I don't think nobody's counting this, except for global witness, which is uh, which they are doing. <coughs> so another thing that we do in the in the <coughs> in this uh, form is to ask for whether the people doing the filling in the or the lump, the three or four people or the act, local activists or local academics or young scholars and then the form goes up and then we moderate the form at the end in Barcelona three or four people and we put it in moderate means to correct internal or to go back and ask for more information so at the end when we put this on the in the others we can count how many of these cases have been considered to be successes in environmental justice or failures or not sure. As you see, not sure it happens quite often. 34% per, 34 of the cases by April last this year. And many are characterized as failures in environmental justice. But 17% of the cases are marked in the form as environmental justice successes. You can check this and see whether. You can check this, for instance, if you are from Italy, you can take the Italian cases and very easily through in the Atlas itself, you go there and you click a couple of times and you will see whether Italy, which has about 40 cases, I think, or 45 cases in the map, so it's a small sample, but uh, reasonably convincing, whether this percentage is higher than in the world or lower. Well, I would guess it's lower than in the world in general, isn't it? Because in Europe, people don't get killed so often. But sometimes they get killed, as happened to Remy Fraisse recently, isn't it? In, in France, in Sivan, it's called, fighting against a, complaining against a dam. Or also, what was his name? Vital Michalon, a long time ago in France also. In, in uh, what's the name of the place where they wanted to do a, a reactor, a plutonium reactor, isn't it? In Crimalville. So that's the only two cases of French environmental defenders killed, which I remember, but I don't remember everything, of course. So there might be others, but much less in proportion than in Peru, for instance, or in Colombia, or in Philippines, for instance. This is about killing people, but about successes, you could also check whether the rate of success in environmental justice is higher in Europe or in Latin America, according to our forms. And of course, we have done some research on the consistency of the forms, and this correlates very well with 
projects being stopped. When a project is stopped, then it's considered to be a success in environmental justice. But it's not always like this. The first case I showed in the US, in North Carolina, people trying to stop the trucks, they failed, isn't it? And nevertheless, this was the moment in which the environmental justice movement started according to the US people who belong to the environmental justice movement. So it's not like this, uh, that stopping a project is a success and failing to stop is a failure. It's more, but it fits together normally. So now I stop with the others and I go to this vocabulary of the movement of environmental justice. And I'll go quickly through it and leave you to read through it, perhaps more than speaking because you probably read faster than I can speak English. So, but environmental justice I have already mentioned. Those who don't know this, if you go to Wikipedia or anywhere, you will find environmental justice. You will find this is a philosophical topic, isn't it? About justice with future generations or towards species. But this is in philosophy or environmental philosophy. In sociology, in environmental sociology, and history, environmental justice is this movement which started in the US in the uh, early 80s and with this content. And words like environmental racism or popular epidemiology were belong together with this movement in the US. Ecological debt does not belong to, with the US, belongs with, uh, well, with climate debt, which will be now discussed in Paris now it's called loss and damage, isn't it? They are changing what was called the ecological debt. Or environmentalism of the poor, which comes from the from India and from Latin America, more or less simultaneously in the late 80s. Food sovereignty comes from Via Campesina. Biopiracy comes from Pad Muni from Canada, but was used very much by Vandana Shiva and became popular because of her books, I would say. But of course, very old, and it goes back to the 17th century or 18th century. Europeans stealing genetic resources and the knowledge about the genetic resources. For instance, for Chinchona officinalis, for Queen, 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 Climate justice is part of the ecological. Or the, the movement for climate justice claims that there is an ecological debt from north to south and uses this. Of course, there are other people who are not activists, like Henry Shu, for instance, in Oxford, who writes about this. But this is the kind of bottom-up movement. And water justice is used by Rudy Bell and some people. And then this I already mentioned against eucalyptus. Land grabbing is very old also. The fact, isn't it? But the name is not so old. And of course, it's a name which implies some complaint about it, isn't it? You don't say, for instance, the World Bank likes, likes to call this land acquisition, which is much, much more polite, isn't it? So people are not polite when they, they are angry, perhaps. The source caps comes from Europe, but they put it together with these words, which to organize or to jasonize, organize from the Ogoni in Nigeria, this is there. If you go to this, you will find uh, a lot of papers and books written in the last few years about leaving oil in the soil or leaving coal in the hole, as they say, or leaving gas under the grass, another bad poetry like this. And which, of course, you are Nicholas Stern, who lives in London, I think. He says recently, one cannot take all the gas, the oil, and the coal with the speed that we are doing, isn't it? And he's quite right. We have to reduce the speed by half if we want to avoid increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This has not been invented by Nicholas Stern. The idea of leaving oil in the soil comes from Nigeria and from Ecuador, and we know the people, Nimo Basi, Esperanza Martinez, we know the day, the day, the place where they started to say this in the 1990s, and it has spread quite a lot with, for local reasons, but of course linking the local reasons to climate change. 
rights of nature in the Constitution of Ecuador, corporate accountability, I was involved in this in Johannesburg without any success for an international convention of corporate accountability, isn't it? Which is something a bit stronger than corporate social responsibility. This comes from, I think, from San Francisco, critical mass for cyclists, or this. We were talking now, it should be about Delhi or Pune or Bogota, for instance, there are in Bogota now they give uniforms to recyclers and a bit of money every month and they go to the meetings of climate change and say we are helping against climate change. This is something they use in the States. I read in France they call this jardinage urbain, which is but guerrilla food gardening and and this is the last in the, in the names in the list. These both come from Latin America, and Latin Americans will know about this. But this is quite strong as a movement. And this, of course, comes from the indigenous movement around the world, which has been making progress. And this comes from India, and this comes in Chinese, and translated from China. And there is a book by Anna Laura Wainwright, who is a professor in Oxford, in the human geography of China, and she uh, and other people are working on this. This means what it says here: it's small, relatively small towns, villages with all the industry, who have asbestos or heavy metals, and this has become like a, a name used also by the authorities, but coming from journalists or from people. So I am sure that in for many countries we could find other words like this, and we put here. Energy sovereignty is coming up, sacrifice zones come from the states, ecocide comes from the Vietnam War, but here in London, Polly Higgins, who is a barrister or used to be a barrister, wants to have an international convention against ecocide, but this started people complaining at the time of the Vietnam War and Asian Orange or the call for an international tribunal, and so on. This comes from Italy, as it is used, and so on. I'm almost finished. And, <clears throat> what, and before finishing, at the beginning I said, I would like to say something about this connection between degrowth and environmental justice, because I am very much involved in Barcelona with other people, including Professor Giorgio Scalis, who is here in the room, and who is spending some months here and um, so as on the degrowth, or call it as you wish, prosperity without growth, or post vaxtum they say in Germany, because they think that degrowth is too strong, perhaps, or, uh, or decroissance. So this comes from decroissance in French, isn't it? That's why it started in France. And what this movement says that we should not grow at all, or degrow a little bit, even if we, the economy would degrow, we would still use too much fossil fuels in an industrial, because, and we would still go to the commodity frontiers to extract fresh supplies because energy is not recycled, isn't it? So this is why George S. Corregan wrote the book called The Entropy Law and the Economic Process. Energy is not recycled, therefore, even a degrowing economy if based on the fossil fuels, would still uh, provoke this kind of conflicts at the, and we could discuss about the materials. So there are many connections, for instance, in Naomi Klein's book about climate change, this work appears, Blockeria, that she learned in Canada, the US, in Montana, places like this. Well, it's very similar to the idea of leaving oil in the soil in Yasuni, in Ecuador, or in Ogoni land, or in the Niger Delta in general, is also very similar to the idea of resource caps in Europe, isn't it? So, and now comes an advertisement, because I wrote this article, which is the article to tell that this is my favorite article I have written. I'm not sure. I have written too many articles, perhaps. I mean, too many bad articles. <laughs> or some bad articles. But this is, is not bad at all. I thought it was it's a, good, <laughs> it's a good article because it tries to make this connection, isn't it? So it's not that some people in the north go to the countryside and become degrowers, isn't it? And 
and with Le Droit à la Paris, uh, to, and so on, and they do a little bit of agroecology, uh, to put it like this. No, it's a very political thing because if you are preaching the growth in the North, you have to be at the same time in favor of this global environmental justice movement, which perhaps exists because they fit together, isn't it? People are complaining, and this in the South, because of all, in all these conflicts, in the South and in the North also, quite often, isn't it? Because there is also mining in the North. And, and for instance, in Greece now, there is, if you look at the film, now Mi Klein's film, it almost starts with things happening in Greece. Isn't it? Because of the crisis, mining is coming back. So this happens everywhere, and the connections are everywhere. So these are the conclusions. I think that more or less I said Everything, I repeat, this is not original, the idea of these others. Other people have tried, started to do this. And what we have done is to, we have done it, we are doing it, we are going to go on doing it with other people, collaborators. We, perhaps there is 100 collaborators around the world in the others. And what we can prove is that there are all these complaints, and they are not only about distribution, but there is a lot about distribution of environmental goods and bads. This is why I call these things, these conflicts, ecological distribution conflicts. They are not economic. They are not about salaries or prices. They are about who pollutes whom, or who is suffering because of lack of water, or because they lose the land. So it's not economic in that market sense of the world, or even in a Marxist sense of the world. It's not about the Osrafian sense of the world, if there are economists here. It's about uh, the environment, isn't it? And this was missed by ecological distribution conflict as something that political ecologists study, not political economists, although they can they can do it if they want to, but they are no longer political economists. They belong, they become political ecologists, isn't it? Political ecology studies ecological distribution conflicts and the power, the political power that makes things go one way or the other way. So I think this is the end. Yes. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Martinez Ali, for, for sharing with us this very interesting work. And I will have Subir Sina uh, giving us like a few comments on the talk, and then we will open the floor to your questions. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Jean, for an extremely wide ranging uh, you know, talk, and also I'm uh, amazed at the scope and ambition of what you're trying to do. Um, so perhaps, you know, uh, let me ask some uh, provocative questions to you precisely about the uh, scope and scale of what you're trying to do. And, uh, you know, maybe perhaps some clarification in terms of how some questions uh, could emerge uh, from two of, the, of your key terms, uh, which are global and justice. And in addition to that, I want to sort of, uh, you know, uh, ask you some methodological questions, particularly about the uh, categories and so on. But before that, I thought since there was a lot of bad poetry that uh, you know, Jean quoted, I could quote you one from the American Lifestyle Environmental Movement, which went along the lines of uh, when it's uh, yellow, let's be mellow, when it's brown, flush it down, uh, which was about conserving water in your toilet, which was a big slogan of the American Environmental Movement in the 1980s and 1990s. So, one on the issue of global. Uh, you know, what we saw is that there are myriad, uh, you know, episodes and events uh, of conflict over resources that you have mapped out. But why would you think of them as global in the sense that uh, are there any connections between them? Uh, is there a consciousness of being global? Because some of them are networked and obviously some of them are not. Uh, so what does it do to your project to think of them, of, of all of this, as a global movement for environmental justice, rather than movements for environmental justice which are distributed across the world? Uh, so that, that would be one. Secondly, uh, I wanted to ask you also about the fact that there is a network social movements element to what you suggested. Uh, is there anything to be learned from the fact that you mentioned Patrick McCulley's work 
and work of the 1990s, one could think of environmental movement networks of that age that also broke down. For example, if you look at the International Fish Workers Federation, uh, it ultimately broke down because the Canadians and the environmental fishing people thought of fish as primarily a resource that they could exploit for income, whereas a lot of fishing populations in Latin America, or particularly in South and Southeast Asia, thought of it as a defense of a way of life as well. And that basically brings me to the question of uh, different uh, th ways of thinking about uh, environment, nature, and ecology, different valuations, if you like, and whether or not there is a kind of an incommensurability between some of uh, some of those. So, for example, you have in the Indian uh, anti-mining movement against bauxite, uh, the movement of uh, tribal people in the east of India, who make the claim for justice by saying that these mountains under which the bauxite lies are holy mountains for us. In fact, they call them the law-giving mountains, the Niyamgiri mountains, and there is no uh, compensation of a monetary variety that they would be willing to accept for those mountains to be destroyed. So clearly a kind of valuation which lies outside of any kind of an economic or a market framework. And uh, in contrast to that, you know, uh, claims for, for example, compensation, uh, when you look at things like industrial uh, catastrophes like the ones in Bhopal and so on and so forth, which ask for more material things, money, long-term health care support, and, and the like. So uh, that's 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 the second question, whether in the wide range of cases that you're talking about, on the question of how, value, how you value the environment, there are not embedded incommensurabilities, which actually would come in the way of there being something like a global movement. And that also, I think, has something to do with the way in which the word justice might be complicated because uh, whereas we can see all of these movements uh, emerging from a variety of different places, uh, Latin American history, both of dictatorships and the state forms that emerge after that, but also of colonization and the social movements that one sees over there, seem to be quite different from the Indian cases given our own colonial histories, the legacy of Gandhi and, if you like, of Maoism and so on. So there are these other surrounding you know, issues uh, which have a strong effect on how justice is articulated. And it seems to me that uh, from that point of view, how one talks of justice uh, is coded in a range of not just cultural language and those kinds of things, but effectively political experiences, political histories, what the political terrain looks like and things of that sort. So that again, I'd like to... On the methodological thing, I mean, just looking at some of the categories, you mentioned the question of women in the sense that obviously that's one category that cuts across a number of the other, if not all of the other categories that you put up there. But also, you know, there could be overlaps between categories like farmer, indigenous, poor, and things of that sort. So what, how do you separate out categories to minimize overlaps, or does it even matter? in terms of uh, you know, what you're uh, looking to achieve. And I'll just close with one last question, uh, which is about, uh, you know, I mean, a, a number of claims for uh, justice based on an ecological you know, logic these days also come from the far right. So for example, if you look at the Indian case, uh, I'll just give you two examples. Uh, discourses regarding rivers. Uh, the holiest of the rivers being the Ganga, uh, are extremely closely allied with the Hindu far right, who think of it as a kind of uh, holy river, uh, and so on and so forth. And the other one, which again has a kind of lifestyle component to that, is the militant movement against the eating of beef in India. Uh, and in fact, what is quite interesting is that the same people who otherwise are attacking people to death for that, have now latched on to California vegetarianism, and even the vegan movement in California, as a justification because you know it takes a lot of water and uh, feed in order for people to have a kilogram of meat and things of that sort. So would you, for example, include that in something like a, and one could think of several other examples, especially the American wilderness movement or the Yuna Bomber type of a manifesto, where all of these things also have some kind of a fundamentally anti-democratic and also uh, you know, end up targeting certain popular segments of the population as 
enemies of the ecological values that they're trying to articulate. So I'll just leave it at that. Thanks. You have quite a few questions already. Do you want to briefly answer these and then we go to the audience? No, start from the. I mean, these are good questions. I don't know whether. I mean, uh, believe everything you said, or if you are just trying to promote the discussion. But, uh, can you address it on the, on the, on the beef? Not exactly the beef, but I, I remember that for Catalonia we have about 10 cases in Caracas, which is 7 million people. And of course, I, I know the country well. And we have the case of the movement against bullfighting. Bullfighting is not good, beef eating is much worse, I think. Uh, and but in this case, what you are saying could be, could be, why is this an environmental movement to go with food fighting? In Catalonia, is very much, as I don't think in Catalonia nowadays, is very much uh, part of the nationalist movement because in Spain, they like food fighting, therefore in Catalonia, we don't want food fighting. <laughs> One could have a lot of discussion. You can go to a database form of food fighting in Catalonia and see what was put there, I didn't write that for myself. So I don't know exactly what it says, but would be like this, something which is not really environmentalist of the poor or even environmental justice in this kind of, of class way that I explain it is more, well, it's more part of what is called, at least in the continent or in France or Spain, the animalist movement, pro-animal movement, which I think is a very civilized thing to, to do without religious overtones, but nationalist overtones, which you might say, well, this does not fit what you said before that, I quite think. So there are like fringe movements around the bulk of the movements, which is about, for India and in Machal Pradesh, at least as far as I know, it's not only the Hindu right, because there are lots of doubts. We have many cases from Machal Pradesh, because one of our collaborators is writing a thesis on this, and she, but there are large dams now in the, in the in the, in the Himalayas, everywhere from Sikkim to, and of course there are many complaints of different sorts of complaints. I don't think it's only the Hindu right. The and Narmada was also sacred, more or less, and it was not the Hindu right which complained. So there, this is what we have caused with um, people languages of valuation. For instance, the case in in, in Odisha with Vedanta and the Niyamjiri, he wrote an article on this, but I don't think here. So in that case, the company is the same. Vedanta is Vedanta, <coughs> whether it's in Zambia, in Liberia, it's in the also have iron mining, and Vedanta could become Rio Tinto anyway, or whoever is going to buy Vedanta if, if they are in financial trouble. So on one side, is a typical extractive company. The languages of valuation that people are using, well, as you would agree in the EMGD, is uh, many people are involved and you have global NGOs, local NGOs, but of course the language of sacredness and indigenous rights has uh, won the case in fact for the time being. But there is no problem for what we do. We admit that there are many languages of valuation which are deplored, it's not always, uh, in fact, this would be a case of refusal of compensation and using another language to defend, well, the ter territory or nature or all together, the subsistence livelihood. So in EMG, that's not, is not the problem. The other thing whether this movement exists, sometimes they think, well, all, all your objections are very relevant, but if one thinks about the feminist movement or the labor movement, say, one can there, for instance, many of you would know where the word boycott comes from, or some of you would know. Well, it comes from the labor movement in this country, isn't it? A gentleman called, as I understand, boycott, who opened the, the shop one day, it was a general strike or something like this, and he was boycotted, I hope non violent, I don't remember exactly. So the word boycott, which is used in France, in Spain, in Chile, everywhere in the world, and in India also, isn't it? So it comes from the labor movement in this country. The word picket, as in, Chile, in Argentina, they say piqueteros. The word picket comes from the picket line in the side. The word draft in 
French in the sky, and it's used in Portuguese, the Rebbe, they use the same, they imported the word because they imported the things, and they, they could have invented or used a Portuguese name. But in, so there was at one point a kind of labor movement, more or less international, which caused many regional variations in the names and in the substance, of course, and uh, avatars that they took. So I, I see it in the same way. Like feminists has a very different. And what is common with feminism is, is that in this movement, in the environmental justice, there is no political or central committee or central organization. Somebody like Henry Bastion dislikes it very much when they talk to him. Because now, I mean, it's a good point saying, how do you can say that there is a movement if there is no organization? What? It's like this. So my phone is like this. And I like it also. And then, so, well, we cannot prove anything from words. But in fact, the fact that these words spread around means, I think, something. And I think more less. But for the fishermen, you're totally right. I remember Thomas Pocelli and India and so on. This, I don't know why it failed in the war. But there are attempts to bring it up again because the conflict is there. It's overfishing and people complain in many places. So, uh, but it's so that it's not so clear that this always uh, exists. Okay, now open to you. We will collect three questions and then we will have answers from this part. Please. I'd like to follow up sort of from what you've started already, uh, answering or asking about for evaluation, because it seemed that you were asking about were conflicts successful or not, whether it was relatively self-evident who was right and who was wrong. Um, but, you know, I can think of two examples, but I'm sure there are many, many more when you in fact have two different environmental movements who have different aims and are fighting each other. Or or at least it's not that clear cut who, who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. But in Germany at the moment we um, you know there is a strong movement um, to get rid of fossil fuels. This is a long term aim. So you have part of the movement uh, trying to uh, increase wind energy to replace fossil fuels. You have another part of environmentalists um, fighting against that part of the movement to prevent them from putting windmills up in areas that they consider environmentally beautiful, that shouldn't be destroyed. Um, and they're both accusing each other of being um, fronts for some um, commercial interests of various sorts. Very different. This is just something that comes to my mind, but just to, to, to explain my point. In Kenya and Tanzania, you have the Maasai people um, trying to uh, do away or to, to reduce um, the, the area, the reserves for wild animals because they want the water for their cows and they think we need the cows more urgently than tourists coming into countries need to see antelopes and elephants. So you, again, you have a movement protecting wild animals, some of which are you know, in danger of extinction, fighting movements for the rights of indigenous people. So who are the good guys, who are the bad guys here? Uh, it's, it's just, you know, there are always, so, okay, what's your take on this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Chris, uh, thank you, my name is uh, Nils Hama. I used to be based here in SOAS, but the past year I was working for a U.S. institution, which are uh, part of the soft power component of the U.S. government. So it was more regarding doing research in this area here. So I was teaching political economy and climate change. What struck me was that there's a very strong current in the U.S. government of using environmental movements, uh, funding them through a major network of international NGOs uh, to oppose uh, industrial development in many countries. And I would like to hear if you can say a few more words about this and what your research uh, shows. Uh, for example, in Vietnam, it's the U.S. State Department who's strongly involved in organizing resistance against damming which then the government says, well, this is because you want to, to limit the uh, supply of energy for the industrialization plants in the country. 
Bolivia has a shut down railroad and uh, road plans to connect the south to the, to the north. We also the US government has been accused of being involved in mobilizing the migrants' movements. So could you say a little about how to distinguish between who is actually moving in, the, in this uh, in, in this political economy of, of the environmental injustice? Uh, I mean, so I came across uh, this movement that you were on the recently, and one of the things I read about was of this Canadian economist called Peter Linker, who uh, did a, uh, a revision of the scenario in Canada of how this uh, the growth would evolve. So I wanted to ask about that, what the output of that was, and if there's any possibility for us to see something like that happen. Well, the, the last time is easy to answer. Peter Victor, and he was with Tim Jackson. Many people would know Tim Jackson around here, I hope. As the author of Prosperity Without Growth. So I do could read that book. I think a second edition is coming. And I totally agree with this, but this is not what matters in this context. The question is that for instance, Tim Jackson, who is a very good ecological economist, he does not go into, because you cannot do everything in life on a book, he does not go into this kind of opposition to, to extraction and to pollution which exists in the world from these uh, grassroots of whatever you call it. He doesn't, um, but he could, he could um, say, take into account this and, and then the, the growth movement would be reinforced because of all this. You don't want, for instance, the growth means to produce less carbon dioxide. One way of producing less carbon dioxide is to listen to what people in the South are saying in some places about keeping oil in the soil, which is not something invented in Washington or in London, but invented in the United States in the 90s. So that's what a good answer. On the, the question of whether these environmentalist movements are financed by the CIA or the equivalent, well, I, I have seen enough in my life to believe almost everything about the American soft power, as you put it, or explaining what you know. But I think that Eva Morales, and it doesn't matter whether they are more a right wing or, or left wing, for instance, at one point, the secretary of NATO, who was from Denmark about two years ago, came to London and in Chatham House said, Putin is financing all the anti fracking movement in Europe. <laughs> he said this, isn't that? Look at the newspapers. I can remember what was his name. A Danish name. Anastos. Anastos. So, Anastos. Yeah, and at the same time, people like, so Putin was there. And it's not Evo Morales or Correa, or Evo Morales particularly, or Garcia Rivera, his vice president, especially. They say it's the US who is financing the environmental movements. So it's, it's all nonsense. It's not like this at all. It's movements that appear of people complaining against, for instance, if one studies the kick in this case in Bolivia, that we have in the map. So you can go and see the database form and this information, which are the NGOs which were active, or the indigenous groups, and so on. So this idea that environmental is a luxury of the rich and that, that the poor people are not environmentalists is something which I think there is ample proof to show is not true. And so the Latin American governments that say this, what they say is that that the Latin American left or the Communist Party in Western Gulf, for instance, when they uh, opposed what were these places where they, they were promoting industry against rural people, and the rural people complained, it was not because the rural people were being financed by the US government to prevent the industrialization of England, isn't it? Although these things sometimes are even. So I hope that they can. So I, I disagree with your, well, I don't know what you think yourself, but I mean, it's true that 
in Bolivia or in West Bengal or from the from other political corners, some people tend to think that this uh, environmentalism of the poor is being financed by, I don't know whom, the Vatican or Washington or Moscow or Pekin, or, and it's not true, it's not like this coming to the world. <coughs> so on the windmills, I only answer the windmills because the windmills is true that many people who are environmentalists are in favor of the windmills, I am also in favor of windmills, but if you go to Oaxaca in Mexico or to some places in Maharashtra, Gujarat, there is a company in India called Susul, Susul, big company who they are doing lots of windmills. So the people, local people complain, not because, well, they, they are complaining because they are against the companies taking the land. They accept that the wind does not belong to them, which in itself is, a, is why not? I mean, who is the owner of the wind? Neruda has a poem about this, saying, aire no te vendas, wind don't sell yourself. Neruda, we look for Neruda, aire no te vendas. And, but they accept that the wind is not their own property, but the land, they, be, they use the, the land for pasture or for agriculture. The case is that we, I know about windmill conflicts in the south are about this. The cases in Toscana and so on are different. It's about the landscape and then you have clearly this encounter between people worried about climate change and the energy and people more worried about the landscape. But in the south, well, people also worry, they like the landscape, but it's often about the land. So what one has to do is to study the cases. But it's not that in general there is a conflict between, well, I think there is a conflict very often between conservationism and the environmentalism of the poor. And in fact, I would like it to be this often this conflict. And sometimes, as I said, in the case of mangroves, one can find that there is a conflict. But sometimes you are right, there is a conflict between conservation and environmentalism of the poor. So energy, renewable energy and worry about life. Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm Andrea Rigon from UCL, actually the part of the Development Planning Unit. And we do a lot of work supporting and documenting the environmentalism of the poor, but I think I'd like your thoughts because I see a big contradiction between that and the kind of work we do and the kind of thinking around the growth. If we are as academics inviting even for a two minutes presentation on the other side of the world, we fly there and we have an environment, uh, we have a personal, and I say in my department at least, a footprint that is thousands times bigger than one of the people we work with to make them more resilient, to adapt them to climate change, to reduce their own emissions. And, and as, as long as there is budget, we fly everywhere. We do. So I found these struggles, and I was so happy to see that linkages between the growth and environmental of the poor, but we haven't found a solution. We are on that side of supporting the poor and all at the same time justifying our kind of crazy lifestyle. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? Well, I could explain what are my actions, but I mean, yeah. 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 Yes, uh, Professor, um, uh, I really appreciate your work on make this atlas and also make this uh, work. But my question is about uh, one key concept uh, that was raised by the, by the first question about who are the good or the bad guys. But in the, in, in the center of this discussion is the concept of justice. And, uh, and as you, 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 you approach the issue of environmental justice, well, who, who, who is saying what is justice? Justice for one, justice for the bad guys, justice for the for, for the for, for the good guys. And then I came on the on the issue of the state. The state is actually empty or, or, or was not uh, tackled by in, in your presentation. These initiatives, this uh, these fights, these struggles, uh, 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 are they against the state? Are they against the companies? And and how and how then? And who is the body who, who can say what is justice, what is right, what is uh, but is not right in terms to judge uh, uh, these environmental initiatives. 
Um, thank you very much for your talk. And actually, uh, this was pretty much my question as well to say there is no central organization or agency. Then, how are certain actors kept uh, accountable for injustice when it comes to environmental justice? So, who sets the rules of what is justice and what is injustice, and who is held accountable and for what? Yeah, well, this could be very difficult questions, but I think I think they are easy in a way because the environmental justice movement, as it developed in the U.S., and then became, in my view, became rather co-opted by the state, or they themselves let themselves let themselves be co-opted by the state. In the sense, for instance, Clinton uh, <coughs> gave. A, an executive order recognizing the environmental movement and so on. So in the States, these conflicts are not, not very strong. But the movement started as a movement against environmental injustice and environmental racism as the protagonist saw it, isn't it? They said this, there are environmental injustices because we are being polluted, because not only because we are poor, because but because we are black or Hispanic in greater proportion than in our area than elsewhere, and so on. And I think this same approach can be applied in many other places. And in fact, if you go to Mozambique, there is a group which belongs to Friends of the Earth, calling themselves Justice, the Justicia Ambiental in Portuguese. If you go to Brazil, they also use very often justicia ambiental, and there is a movement in Carajás where the, the iron ore goes for export, no? From exploited by Valley Company mostly, where there was this is in Carajás, is not in Minas Gerais, where there was this spill a few days ago, a few weeks ago, and they call themselves this movement because of the railway. They call themselves justice in the railway. Justicia nostrillo. So the word justice itself appears very often in this kind of thing. So who is right or who is wrong? Well, this depends on, on if you are the, the belong to a company like Rio Tinto, you think that these uh, things can be solved probably by better corporate social responsibility actions or by the police perhaps or that it is the work of agitators there must be many different views about this the question that we are trying to do with other many other people around the world belonging to environmental movements of, of the poor is to make these conflicts visible and when you see these conflicts you could spend your whole life you know one single conflict trying to apportion right and wrong, isn't it? Because they are very complex, each of them, but or most of them. But the fact is that the world, and this goes to the, back to the windmills, why there are so many windmills? Because of the metabolism of the economy. We, could, we, we are getting too much fossil fuels, therefore we're going to do something else. The metabolism increases, we go to the commodity frontiers, or we export the waste, and therefore there are conflicts about the use of the environment. I'd never use good guys, good guys and bad guys, isn't it? Because it's not like this. But there are people who are on the receiving end, in general, and people who profit from the from the use of the environment as a disposal place or a place to take the resources. This is what it is. For instance, it's very clear with carbon dioxide. There are people who, like myself, for instance, who are producing far too much carbon dioxide uh, compared to what would be the world average tolerable to avoid uh, further increases in the temperature. And other people who, if everybody lives like in India or Bangladesh, the average, I mean, there would be no climate change problem, isn't it? It's like this. If everybody would have the emissions of the average India, I am not saying the rich India, if everybody in the world, 7 billion people, would have these emissions, we would just start worrying about climate change. But of course, so that's what I am using the word justice in this kind of distributive sense, 
regarding ecological distribution conflicts. Then there are issues of participation and recognition, which have been discussed quite often. But I think, well, I don't know, I don't know whether I'm answering or repeating myself, but I mean, this is how we see it. And also another point they haven't made, but perhaps should be made, is that we are not into the issue of solving conflicts. I mean, partly because how do you solve 1,600 conflicts around the world? I have no idea how. But also, I think the question is not how to solve conflicts, the question is how to study the conflicts, to study whether what the outc outcomes are, and whether these conflicts are really helping to have a less unsustainable economy. So this is the this conflict sometimes when you stop Vedanta in the Niamgiri here, you are stopping the mining of bauxite in the production of aluminium. Well, I have nothing against production of aluminium in principle, but perhaps there is too much aluminium being produced because it's very intensive in electricity, the aluminium. But of course, you cannot go from one case to this, but the historical logic, so to speak, of these movements Locally, as this was a question, they are very local, but they have networks sometimes, or so one can identify patterns. And the logic they have is that they are helping to have a less unsustainable economy. This is what I think can be said about them. So solving them, depending, sometimes they are solved by, by killing people. This is the truth, isn't it? or by exiling people. Sometimes they are peacefully solved, but this is not the issue. The, the issue is to solve problems and not conflicts. Okay. There are questions within another round of things. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations for the interview class and thank you for your inspiring talk. And I totally agree with the idea of, uh, of a global environmental global environmental justice movement. But since you say that uh, you have so many collaborators, I was wondering uh, how do you corroborate the data about the many environmental justice? Um, so last week I, I pulled my coach ticket to Paris for the climate marches, only to a couple of hours later find out that they've been banned by the French government. So this is very much like a current issue and one I would like for you to comment on perhaps as both an activist as a, uh, and a scholar. Um, could this be a symptom of other social conflicts crowding out uh, the fight and struggle for climate justice, and <coughs> could this uh, symptom be found elsewhere, and perhaps even um, the worst instances uh, being as results of uh, these underlying distributional conflicts, leading to, for instance, uh, conflicts on water, uh, conflicts arising from mass migration due to environmental degradation. What is the threat to the movement of climate justice? Is that there is one, otherwise you can start answering this now. Yeah, on this question of the corroboration, well, I mean, depending, what we are studying is that in the map is conflicts, whether, and people make allegations. In fact, one of the, when we had this list of groups taking part in the conflicts, which you asked, we have farmers and indigenous people, religious groups, sometimes, several are acting in the same conflict. Sometimes also the government, not always, for instance, one could compare, I am writing an article about this, mining conflicts in Peru compared to Chile. And I thought at the beginning that in Chile, the government, the members of parliament and the, the, how they call the ombudsman and so on, perhaps would take place more in Chile than in Peru, because I know both countries, well, I think I am wrong. In fact, when one looks at the cases, this is not, but one could, there are many participants, isn't it? And, and they make allegations. 
uh, the people who complain say, for instance, they say that uh, spreading uh, glyphosate in soy plantations is bad for the people, and is bad for is good for the soybeans and bad for everything else, and including people. So, well, there is a big debate about this. The uh, World Organization for Health recently said that glyphosate perhaps was bad for people and produced cancer. And there is a big debate, so we cannot go into the scientific debate. Of course, if somebody would say that glyphosate produces, I don't know, produces, uh, what could it produce, Pro produce <laughs> something uh, totally, uh, some fantastic lie that they would say, we would censor it, or we would go back to the people who wrote it and ask for clarification. But if the allegation is more or less plausible and clearly uh, fits into the conflict, we, we leave it there. We have had some complaints by companies sometimes, including cement companies, for instance, in which there are a lot of complaints in the business world because they are burning domestic waste, sometimes with carbon credits even. And the people who don't like the cement factories because they pollute uh, before, now they know that they are doing this, that they tend to complain. And there is a big debate, so we go to some scientific uh, journal, if we can find it, to see whether the allegations are, are totally unfounded. So one, one criteria, when we, it's not myself, we are a group of people. I say, try to write, uh, if we were writing for, for the financial times, perhaps, but of course with a little bias against the companies, but the, the level of information or for Le Monde Diplomatique, perhaps, for some, a good newspaper. More than this, we cannot do in this form. We cannot do a monograph for each case. And there is a space for complaints, and some people complain. On both sides, they complain. And the other question was the march in Paris. Yeah, I know, I mean, I'm not going to answer your question, although it's a very good question. How? What I am explaining here links with uh, with, with uh, wars in the in the Middle East and and wars on the streets in in Europe. Or, so it's uh, it's not because I, I mean I would like to talk to you about this, but but uh, I don't know more than you do about this. I don't know. I don't think that there is any reason to have wars on water because there is lots of water drains all the time, isn't it, in the world in general. And you can have water desalination at not at such a high energy cost nowadays, or perhaps with solar energy. But people will fight each other for many reasons, sometimes disguised as environmental reasons, or sometimes disguised as other reasons. Isn't it? But this is more than we can say. <laughs> in one talk, and I don't have anything very profound to say about about this. What I would do in Paris, which I also I am asking myself, still I go to Paris, I was meant to be in Paris, and well, I don't know, I mean, we'll see what happens. It's not a joke, isn't it? Because bombs are exploding around the place. So, so but I think it's true that it's a distraction for other things, which some people would say is more important what will happen with the climate than other things which are now being, at least in the, in the medium run. But I don't know what else to say. Perhaps you can come back and say something of what you said, because you cannot ask somebody to solve all the problems in just one and a half, even assuming that they were the, the Pope giving an encyclical, isn't it? He takes one topic at the time. The last encyclical is about the, the environment. The last one about peace was, I think, 30 or 40 years ago. And so, so sorry, because perhaps I'm disappointing you. If I were you, I would think whether you should go to Paris or not carefully, isn't it? Okay, there are the questions we can have a final round. There, okay. Uh, uh, 
Uh, my name is Jasmine. I'm from UCL. I would like to know uh, regarding the data. Is it only uh, the numbers of cases or those represent a country or how is it? Because I just uh, check it and I found it that Indonesia has 30 cases, which I believe way more than that. Uh, how do you like put these cases based on yeah. only famous cases that are being uh, covered by the media and which most people knows about or how is the data being generated here and being represented Yes, we have been working on this since 2012, okay? And little by little we have been, and we, it depends on whom we have on the other side helping to fill in the cases. For instance, if you go to Latin America, Colombia has more cases in the map than Brazil and Mexico. And this is totally wrong in the sense that there are many more environmental conflicts in Brazil, which has... Uh, what, three, three, almost four times the population of Colombia and the north of Brazil is, is a lot of conflicts on land, or Mexico, isn't it? Which has three times the population of Colombia. The reason is that there is a group in Colombia and somebody called Mario Perez, this is the reason. Mario Perez, who studied in Barcelona with me and is a very hardworking person, has managed to have a group of course, in Colombia, there are now, I think, 110 cases. How many there are in truth in Colombia? Nobody knows, but perhaps there are 500 or 400 environmental conflict cases which are worth reporting. I don't think they are all emblematic or spectacular, or, but if you ask the people, little by little, they would find. But I think we are pleased with having 100. For Indonesia, it's like China, is a case where I know Wally, the environmental group, Friends of the Earth, and we are trying to get cases from Indonesia, and we have not managed to have. Uh, but now this project has more, more money for the next two years, so we are going to get cases in Indonesia if the local activists are willing to help and this we find hap happens always, perhaps you, yourself, I don't know. But it happens because people think it's a good idea, I don't know what you think, to make these cases visible. But there is a contrary opinion sometimes saying, you make it visible, but also what will the police and the army think. But we don't use confidential, everything that is in the forms is already known is already known and some people use pseudonyms instead of the real names but has been published in local newspaper and so in the case of indonesia there is also a question of the of the local language which for you is no problem isn't it but if you are from barcelona it's uh, so we have to to get our act together and and but there is no well perhaps you have some ideas there is no way of saying this map represents statistically all the relevant conflicts in the world. We're going to work now from people who say, like a review of an article a few weeks ago, the reviewer said, you are saying, you, you are missing a lot of mining conflicts in India. So we wrote back saying, please give us a list of 20, of the 20 most important ones that you think are missing. So he did not reply yet. Is the way of, I don't know whether anybody has done this kind of map before, in fact nobody, but there must be other examples of this in many other fields. How you build up a kind of incomplete inventory out of which you can draw some conclusions, but not other conclusions. And all this is going to go through peer review at the end, isn't it? if we publish these things. So we don't know what will happen. Okay, it was very enlightening. I just have a quick question about how you choose which cases to actually include. You talk about the importance of cases, but um, is there a criteria? Because um, I myself, I've worked on the grain database for land grabs, uh, on the most recent one that's yet to be published. And we have a new criteria where we decide, okay, we're looking at land grabs that are above a thousand hectares, or that's how we've decided you know, arbitrarily in some cases, like what a big land grab consists of. I was wondering, I mean, your, your EJ Atlas was indispensable to the mining. They had it's really, really, really good. Um, 
but how do you decide which cases should go in and which should not? Well, I think that we cannot answer in general. I think we would have to think in a kind of uh, thought experiment. I'm saying, for instance, in Indonesia, well, Indonesia is very large, many people, many, many, many conflicts. But if you take little by little a province that you know, for instance, this what happens with me with well, some places in the world, with Peru or Chile or, or Catalonia or even, for instance, we have explain better. For the US, this was done by Paul Mohai, who comes from the environmental justice movement in Michigan, and they wrote to 200 people who had been involved in the environmental justice movement. So it's a bit against white, so to speak, just to start with. But, uh, and they said, what do you think are the most important, relevant, emblematic cases in the US that we are going to fill in with a group of people, students and some activists, and we can do 60 or 80. That's what they said. So they selected, um, people said different, and this I think, they have published this in environmental research letters, uh, an article recently, and they explained this method. We have not used the same method everywhere. In Italy, this same method was used to ask the committees, they committed the activists, and it's not so large a country. So I think it's pretty complete what they did. Pretty complete in the sense of the conflicts which are there as people who the experts, I mean the activists or perhaps uh, sociologists, or, would think they are the most important for Italy, but perhaps some are missing. For China or Indonesia, we are very far from this. So that's how we are doing it. We are doing it little by little, depending on the on the help we get and the money we get to do the moderation and filling in the empty spaces. For instance, there is a big empty space from Pakistan to Morocco, which we're going to fill in. We now have to fill it in now with conflicts because there are many conflicts. There are many conflicts from India, about 300, which is little because India is many more people and should, and some I'm very few from Pakistan. So somebody once told me Pakistan must be paying for these elders, isn't it? Because uh, they want to show. So this is how we are doing it. So this criteria that you are saying means that you know already the population, isn't it? You know all the cases of land grabbing in the world, or what you call land grabbing, which in itself is not so clear. And you select those with the 1,000 hectares. Well, you don't know all the cases of land grabbing. Nobody knows. So it's, no, it's not like sampling a population to see whether you're going to vote Labour or Conservative. Okay. You, don't, you don't know the population. Okay, we can then like draw this session to a close. Thank you very much for participating, for raising the important questions. Thank you for Thank you to you for all your inputs. Uh, let me invite you to our last session for this term, which is next Tuesday. We will have Professor Andrea Cornwall from Sussex University on Women's Empowerment, Technological Development and Global Justice. Uh, for those of you who want to stay, there will be a small reception in the staff common room on the first floor. Thank you. <laughs> so, it's very nice to meet you. I have a six year old daughter in the meeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'll see you. What is the email? Rosie, please.